Community begins with family, that natural nuclear entity that we strive to protect and nurture. But today, we're faced with so many choices, from health to education and even entertainment. It has become harder to make the right decisions in our family's best interests. Yet, help is on the way. Creative professionals in this region are developing innovative solutions to address these very personal challenges. One of them is bridging the gap between parents and doctors through her revolutionary use of social media. The other is an entertainer who uses humor to engage and enthrall kids and adults. Together, they'll share how we can all care, curate, and connect on behalf of our loved ones. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Dr. Wendy C. Swanson has made a career of finding her voice and then helping others to do the same. She's a practicing pediatrician who's been hugely successful online with her blog, Seattle Mama Doc. Wendy Sue deciphers the latest medical news and communicates them in a way that makes sense to parents. From what should my baby do at 18 months to cell phone parenthood, this dedicated doctor is helping parents like me do it right. And yet Wendy Sue is also a mother who faces real challenges of her own even as she strives to make better storytellers of medical practitioners. Wendy Sue, welcome. Thanks, nice to be here. So, it's hard enough to practice medicine. You also have this really successful blog. What possessed you to do that? Well, you know, social media landed on my lap. I got lucky in that I've always been interested in the space of how we communicate about health and how what we hear on the news or what we read online changes how we interface with the physician that helps us make decisions. And you know, I used to say, you know, what Katie Kirk says in the morning might change what you say when you land in the pediatrician's office in the afternoon. And how can physicians be part of the genesis of that is the question that I really kind of went down. And then I had my babies and on my second pregnancy I had a long bed rest and during that bed rest I got on Facebook and I started to realize this was this incredible space to provide insight and to share my journey as a parent and to tell the real story I mean that that's the goal it's just the real story so is it a passion a hobby for you or is this actually something that actually contributes to your practice Oh, I, I, this is a job. So, I mean, no question about it. I, I'm not blogging for fun. I enjoy it and I have fun, but I'm blogging really to help provide great information. You know, as a general pediatrician, my job is to really figure out what I do know to help a family answer a question and then to decide what I don't know. And when I don't know something, as a general pediatrician, I have a couple different things I can do. I can find an expert. I can go and look up information and get back to a family. Or I can say, you know, here are the three criteria for the next two days. And if this, this, and this happens, stay home and everything's going to be fine. If this happens, come on back and see me. I mean, that's, that's what we do as a primary care home. Um, and what I realized, of course, is that I went into practice and I um, practiced in Washington State a state that leads the nation in vaccine exemptions and a state that's extraordinarily vaccine hesitant. And although I knew I was going to be talking about vaccines, I had no idea that my day would feel the way that my days felt in the very beginning. How much does that actually surprise you? Because this whole vaccine thing is huge, especially in parents here, as you point out. Yeah. And this is one of the most well-educated regions in the country. How do you resist or do you sort of combat that kind of uh, conversation? Well, I blog about it. But I mean, what I really do is I just tell my story. So, you know, what happened is I'd go, when I first started practice out of training, I was pregnant and I'd tell my stories and I'd talk about science and I'd talk about the study in the Netherlands and I'd talk about my philosophy about Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who's now lost his license and created a fraudulent campaign around the concern that MMR vaccine causes autism, which we now know today much differently than we even did five, six years ago when I started to practice. And then I had my son. And people would look at me in the office after I had my son and they'd say, Dr. Swanson, did, did your son get his shots on time? And I'd say, yeah. And they'd make a decision. Well, that's interesting. So what do you think then, based on all the experience you've had with this blog, what makes for good information that also resonates, that hits people and says, you know what, she's right, I gotta do this? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, I write about 
new studies and I write about new research and sometimes I use Twitter to figure out what to write about. So for example, I share information on the blog and I share information on Twitter and I curate content from new studies to mommy blogs that I read to perspective. But what I can really do is listen to how people are responding. And I can see sometimes on Twitter where myth is being created or miscommunications are happening. And then I can write a blog and say, here's my story. Here's what I believe as a mom. Here's what I believe as a pediatrician. And here's what my friend, the gastroenterologist and liver transplant expert, told me and how I understood the data in a different way. And then I can share that. And my, my goal is to write about hardcore science in a way that you don't notice. And my goal is to just tell my story of what it feels like to be raised raising two boys in a dual working family in a really crazy life while I take care of my mom with chronic cancer. At the same time I interface with a health system that sometimes fails me. That it, I'm a patient, I'm a mother, I'm a doctor, and, and I have all these different roles. And I'm a caregiver for my mom at times, right? And so what I really want is I want patients and doctors to come back together again. You know, besides being really shocked and surprised about vaccine hesitancy, the other thing I've really I've been surprised by in my career is the sense of distrust that, that the community has for the medical profession and for science in and of itself. I mean, last year a study was published in Pediatrics, the journal that represents the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they said, okay, who do you trust about vaccine research? Well, the news lines was really that 24% of families said they trusted a celebrity on vaccine safety information. And everybody wanted to talk about like that. Like Jenny McCarthy. Yeah, like yeah. Jenny McCarthy. Yeah. And her story is her story. It's her anecdote, but it's an anecdote of one. And it doesn't represent studies of 300,000. But the end of that study, and the real story was that 76% of parents said they trusted their pediatrician far and above anyone else. So where is this confusion over trust coming from? I thought doctors are the most trusted people on earth, and why would you even start sort of going against that? I don't think doctors necessarily have gained that trust. I think there's been lots of problems with health. I think it's really hard to call your doctor and get advice when you need it. I think it's really hard to call your physician's nurse and get advice when you need it. I think it's really hard to get an appointment at a doctor's office. And then we bring you in sometimes when you probably don't need to be in because the only way that physicians are reimbursed for care is if you're sitting what I call sclera to sclera with me. And so doctors are de-incentivized. We're, we're incentivized to do the wrong thing as opposed to doing the right thing, which sometimes might just be communicating about health outside the exam space. So you're a medical practitioner, but in many ways you're also an educator. How do you feel about being qualified as such? Well, I was a teacher before I was a doctor, and I think it's a natural transition for me. I, I really believe that that's a huge part of my responsibility as a clinician. Di diagnostics aside, the next most important thing I do is educate families on what science holds in helping make decisions and how to really understand normal from abnormal. And you know, I often say this, but I believe the best pediatricians do the least. They know the wide swath of normal. They don't get CT scans when they don't need it. They don't get x-rays when they don't need it. They don't prescribe antibiotics when they don't need it. The last thing we want is children interfacing in a health system when they don't need that care. Every time you enter a hospital or a clinic or a needle goes into someone's arm, there's risk. Mm. Now, every time you don't get a vaccine, there's risk too. So my job is to tell that story of what is the risk of being unimmunized, what are the risks of immunization, and how can I forge a better understanding for families by sharing my story as a mom and sharing my stories that, of the privilege of taking care of 27 patients on a Thursday. Which of those stories do you believe really hit the mark? Which, what, are they the more personal stories about yourself that really sort of resonate yeah. among people? No yeah. question about it. And I think, you know, I think the glue of the blog are the posts like, what am I doing? I'm exhausted. I didn't sleep last night. I feel sad. My son clings to my leg when I left in the morning. Or last night my, my kid puked for six hours and I didn't sleep and now I'm at work. Yeah. Right? So we as human beings and parents that are exhausted and totally gorked and overwhelmed, that's the reason I think people come back. I mean, I think we want our doctors to be real normal people, and of course they are. Um, but the health institution needs want some sense of divorce to really provide difficult decisions and difficult spaces. But at the same time, in addition to getting information about science, when you, when you go to a care provider, you're actually looking for care too. And you know, where I start at the beginning of a visit with a family who reads my blog versus with a family who doesn't is a different place. Well, that's we just interesting. know each other so, differently. So is there actually any real difference between your patients and the people who read your blog in terms of how you connect with them? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think so. I, I think my patients and I have a much more intimate experience. I know private things about their family. They've given me the privilege to care for and touch and examine their children. Um, that's a sacred place, and it's something I would never um, 
cross a line in, in the public sphere. I, I really believe that that privacy is essential in forming a true partnership. But the relationships I have on the blog are extremely meaningful. I learn so much in that space. So not only do parents read my blog, you know, we know that a huge portion of the readers are physicians too. They're learning about the studies that I'm reading about. They're finding camaraderie in the sense of what it's like to be a physician and young par a parent of young children. And I think we're all learning together that these are places and spaces to be outside of where we used to talk at the water cooler. We really focus on social media in our program that we teach and we recognize especially there's a challenge when it comes to the medical practitioners and using social media. Uh, one of your blog posts called Beginners says, when you're a doctor, remember that your tone in every single word you choose can have lasting power. I thought it was a beautiful line, but you must face challenges because you do have those privacy that issues, that intimacy with your patients, and then you're also sort of providing really useful information online to people you may or may not know. How do you deal with these issues of privacy, even as your colleagues are coming to you for advice about how they can handle social media as well? Well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a tough question. I think there's a lot of hesitancy. I mean, the medical institution in general is extraordinarily risk averse for good reason. I, I think they should be risk averse in some ways. However, when, when so far we have an American Medical Association policy on social media and the tone of that policy is all cautionary. It is, these are the risks that you incur. This is the risk for the profession that you take. You know, this is your risk of, of using your name and the possibility of disclosing, you know, private, personal health information. The other side of that coin is ultimately, this is an opportunity. This is a place to connect with thousands of people. There are some blogs that I've written that have been read by over 30,000 people. So my ability to talk about the data on keeping your kid rear facing in the car seat, I can tell 27 patients in a day, but I might be able to tell 27,000 people in a way that's more evocative and more real and connects them with the data that they might not remember from the exam room visit that they had. So the people must obviously appreciate you. Does the profession, given their very conservative approach to social media, Media, do they perceive you as a renegade then? Or I don't you... think so. I, I don't think I'm a cowboy at all. I think I've taken this on. I've partnered with a really responsible, forward-thinking institution, which is a leading pediatric academic center at Seattle Children's, and I did that very intentionally. I could just go blog for Gerber, or I could go blog on my own, but my idea was we move the needle farther if we partner with academics and if we partner with the intellectual property that comes in an academic center. That is, world-renowned researchers trying to move our understanding of what and how we can cure and prevent pediatric disease. And so I've been very careful to make sure that I am always thinking about some of my mentors. You know, every blog I write, I think about my patients, I think about my children, I think about my husband as a clinician, and I think about my mentors that have really taught me the profession itself. And I think, you know, there are some studies, there's, a, there's not very many, there's a pretty a paucity of studies on physician behavior and the risks. And what we know is that our track record is pretty good. There was a study that was written last year in the Journal of American Medical Association, and I, so, suggesting that, you know, people on Twitter, physicians on Twitter, were disclosing private health information less than 1% of the time. I mean, I think we probably do better in some ways online than we do in the elevator. Hmm. And I think what we have to figure out is how can we train and give people the time and the skills to communicate about health in beautiful, thoughtful ways that involve emotion, if a physician is comfortable with that, and maybe at other times doesn't. But what this will do is this will transform how you and I go to a hospital and how you and I go to a clinic and get care. It isn't that every doctor needs to be on Twitter. What it really is is every doctor needs to be able to communicate with you about your lab results on your cell phone. And we're getting there. Is there a particular blog post that really moved the needle for you in terms of how people responded and how you felt about, oh, that's really what, I, what this is all about. This is why I'm doing this. Yeah, I wrote, I, I wrote a post after I'd been at a coffee shop and I was standing in line behind a brand new dad and he turned to me and saw my children's badge and he said, do you believe in vaccines? And I told him my spiel and I, I went home and thought, oh my gosh, that was the most important two minutes maybe of my career. This guy was a non-vax, you know, he was not vaccinating his newborn. His wife had had them at home. They hadn't even had a physician see the baby at this point. And there was a moment to provide great change. And I wrote 33 pediatricians and I got 33 responses of what would you say? And I collected them in a blog post. And I, I looked at kind of that question of, do you believe in vaccines? 
And that's where it really showed me that there is this incredible amount of insight and information that practicing physicians have because of the privilege of their job. And what we really need to do is elevate their voices and allow the public to come together in a bi-directional way and talk about health care. And we will, we will accomplish so much more for so much less money. And you've elevated those voices and your voice well beyond your even your practicing area. Yeah. Uh, you've managed to have an international audience. Uh, how do you reconcile that? How do you use your very local practice with a very uh, big reach? Well, my local practice is the heart and soul of what I do. You know, that's what I went to medical school for, was to take care of children. And they are in my mind and very present when I'm at work and clinic. When I'm out of that space, I believe that I should try to reach every single parent I can. If I believe that the science that is out there that I am reading and the insight that I get from my colleagues, if I can share that and get parents armed with tools where they can make better decisions and enjoy parenthood more instead of being so anxious and distrustful of their own decisions, I, I've done what I set out to do and you know one of the posts that's been read the most was about car seats and I, about 15 months before the Academy changed their policy I wrote about the data of keeping your child facing the back of the car until age two before the policy was changed and thousands and thousands of people read that and my firm belief is that if one child was rear facing and their life was saved this entire career was worth it. We, and we follow that advice as well. Um, this is obviously very successful for you now. Is it sustainable? Do you see yourself going even further into another direction as you move ahead? Yeah, I don't know that it's sustainable. I mean, I think keeping a practice, raising young children, blogging, doing speaking, and doing television, no, it's not. Um, but I believe that there is a model that I'm figuring out. There is a hybrid to this that is less volume and less uh, amplification even, but sensible, thoughtful communication. And I, I'm getting closer to that. And so, yeah, I think, there's a, I think I'm going to continue to iterate the space of technology and health. I believe I've got great opportunities to help you and me and everyone in our community have better access to information. And I'll use everything I've learned in this space to, to solve that problem. And if you train more of your colleagues to do the same thing, then you, you don't have to take as much responsibility to be out there. As Absolutely. Much, right? Delegating would be just delicious. <laughs> well, no problem. <laughs> that's great. Well, when we return, our next guest is a parent, too. He's figured out how to use humor to engage kids and grown-ups, often in the name of a good cause. The digital revolution has turned communications upside down. It poses challenges and opportunities to professionals seeking to influence and persuade. These are our students in the Master of Communication and Digital Media program, innovators who think entrepreneurially about how to engage communities through storytelling. As creative leaders, together we're charting the future of communication. Want to join us? Find out more at mcdm.uw.edu. Fred Northup Jr. calls himself a professional funny man. From Saturday Night Live to Xbox, he's used his humor to enthrall people in the name of entertainment, marketing, and charity. Fred also plays music for kids as percussionist for Casper Baby Pants. He's been recognized as a Seattle Works Volunteer of the Year, as well as a good citizen by the Seattle Police. So how does Fred combine entertainment and good works to do good business? And when it comes to our families, how do we make smart choices about TV, music, and comedy? Fred, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So you've got your own company, Southdown Creative. Yes. You produce commercials, you do improv at corporate events, you're an auctioneer, you're a musician to entertain kids. How does this word enthrall, which is on your website, which I was yeah. quite taken with, how does that apply to everything that you do? You know, I, I mean, to me, I was just trying to come up with a word that really went beyond just merely kind of entertaining an audience, but really engaging the audience as well. And so I think that's, you know, when I'm thinking of something that's really, truly enthralling, I'm trying to, uh, you know, create a sense of fun on, on kind of more than one level, uh, whether it's something where there's a little bit of an adrenaline rush at the same time as some sort of artistic rush in the, in the way that improv uh, can create, um, but just trying to, you know, kind of to, to push the push corporate events and, and commercials and everything else kind of a little bit beyond the, the, typical, the typical sphere that they play in. So I say an auctioneer at a charity event, how do you enthrall there? I can get, I get the, the kids' music <laughs> and the, the humor stuff, but auctioneering, really? Well, I think, you know, I, I think auctions have been done a, a certain way for a long time in the Seattle area, and Seattle has more auctions 
per capita than any other city in the U.S. Uh, why is that? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's the weather. Seattle also has more charitable giving uh, on average than, than in other cities as well. So I think that's certainly part of it. Um, and I don't know why we've kind of developed this, this kind of perpetual auction culture, but we have it. And, uh, and there are a lot of really great auctioneers in Seattle. And, and things, that, though, have been done kind of the same way. And so, I mean, as an example, do I just did Do they speak as, as slowly as you do? The auctioneers? I mean, do you, is there a certain auctioneer pacing? There's definitely a certain auctioneer pace. Yeah. And a lot of auctioneers, I mean, that is what they do. They are, they are auctioneers first and foremost. So during the week, they're selling cars or cattle or whatever it is they're selling. And then on the weekend, they're selling at a charity auction. Whereas I only am interested in the charity auctions. And I'm more interested in bringing my comedy improv background, my film production background, all of that into the auction world, which people haven't really done before. So as an example, I just did an auction this past weekend at the Seattle Aquarium with an MC friend of mine named Chris Cashman. And we created a comedy video. It was a James Bond theme. We created a comedy video that that, that played on, on their Facebook page before the event. And then at the event, we did this bit where Chris was dressed up with a wig and an eye patch, and he came on as a bad guy. And, and in James Bond style, I showed up in scuba gear, and I took it off and revealed myself as the auctioneer. And then he took off his mask and revealed himself as the MC. And just, you know, just trying to bring a sense of fun and spontaneity to, to auctions. Does which, that make the auctions more successful? You think you be able to get more money in than your colleagues? I think it makes them more successful because sometimes I think we get into this rut with auctions where people feel like. They're so invested in their own auction that they forget that the people who are at that auction probably were at another auction the week before and have probably been invited to an auction two weeks later. And you run into this problem where, you know, I, I see the same thing with corporate events too, where you could take, you know, you know, charity A and swap out charity B's name on the banner over our heads and the auction would not feel different from week to week. And so what I try to do is really find, you know, comedy and bits and, and and entertainment that comes organically from from the event itself. So you know, James Bond theme at the aquarium. I mean, there's so much to play with in that space. But but regardless, I, you know, that's what I try to do is to, and I think that's what improv is is good at too is is pulling comedy out of the space as opposed to trying to push comedy into a particular space. So, so where does that humor come from for you? What's your wellspring? Yeah, I'm, you know, there's a book that a lot of improvisers have read called Truth and Comedy and. For me, as an improviser, it's really all about um, it's about being present in the moment and just finding moments as they happen. So, I mean, we pre-produce some bits, uh, but most of the comedy in improv and in auctions and everything else just happens there in the room. It, it, whatever it is, it's my relationship with somebody, or a waiter drops a dish, or the desserts show up late, or whatever it is. I'm just looking for moments and then finding humor in those. And because I'm just relating to people, because I'm speaking to something that's true in their own lives, that's where the comedy comes from. Is there a character or a bit that works especially well for you that you can sort of try on me right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, for me as an improviser, it's not that it's not it's not stand up for me. It's yeah. not it's not that I'm pre scripting bits really. It's that I'm finding something, you know, in the moment. And and I think that that uh, that's that's why I think that's why improv works. You know that it is truly spontaneous, and yet people can relate to it. And and you know if you're watching a show like Friends or Up All Night or any any show, you're you're looking for m moments that you relate to, whether it's the 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 relationships between characters, even more than the comedy. You know what you're really looking for is the truth in the comedy and. So that relationship and relevance, I mean, you deal with a multiplicity of people, whether it's parents or corporate folks or people who want to give to charities, and kids. How do you, how do you uh, tailor your humor to those specific audiences? It must be quite a challenge. It is, but I, I, uh, you know, I don't spend too much time thinking about it, honestly. I just am a, you know, I like to have fun, and I like to play, and I like to be spontaneous, and, and I like to bring that energy into whatever sphere I'm in. So, you know, in the corporate world, it might be that you know, if I'm doing an event for a big corporation and they have a particular story to tell, it might be that I write a really funny musical number and I stage artists and the singers or, or, or in the audience. What's the thing you've ever done for a at a corporate event that sort of raised eyebrows? Um, you know, it's hard to really do anything wildly irreverent. I mean, everything gets run up the, the ladder at a corporate event. But, um, but, but I did, you know, I have done a lot of these musical numbers where people are 
What I love is doing a musical, for example, where I stage the singers in the audience and I interrupt the speaker, where they're the only ones who know that it's going to happen, and where we get this really uncomfortable, you know, dead silence between the keynote speaker at a 2,000 person Microsoft conference or something and me, where I'm interrupting them and complaining about something and, and uh, people start booing me and, and then, but then all of a sudden I break into song and there's, you can feel it's like you're popping a balloon, you know, <laughs> the tension is released. That's great. It sounds like, a, actually that's kind of a technique you might use at a, at a show at NBC or an SNL kind of situation. Why didn't you just stay in television when you were there in New York? You know, it's funny, how I ended up at Saturday Night Live is I was an intern in the film unit, which was producing the fake commercials at the time, and this great producer, Jim Signorelli, uh, brought me on as an intern, and after about two weeks, he said, you know, you're doing a great job here. Why don't you just come on full-time, leave NYU Film School, come on and work full-time for us. And so I did, but I still really wanted to finish up at NYU, and I, it was really my first full-time production holy job. Grail. That's your it first really, job. I know it was pretty amazing. I was the youngest full-time staff member there, and I was working at Saturday Night Live, and then taking their car service home, and then still hanging out with all my college friends, and having my meals paid for, and hanging out with Adam Sandler and Chris Farley. It was ridiculous. So why'd you leave that? I left that because we got to the summer hiatus, and I had nothing. You know, I didn't have enough production contacts to sustain myself while Saturday Night Live was on break. And so I decided, well, I'm just going to go back to NYU. I really do want to finish up. And I think, you know, parental influence or whatever it was, I had this, you know, a four-year college degree as a goal. And so went back, got my BFA in film production, and then from there moved out to Los Angeles where I had an internship at the Academy of TV Arts and Sciences and fell into production at Warner Brothers Television. And, and worked there for a while before coming up to Seattle. So you come to Seattle, you've got this great experience in the entertainment industry, and now you're doing all these events and projects that seem to be related to causes and to, uh, to charities. And how do you bring that sense of caring to those projects? Well, I, I guess, what do you mean? I mean, because... Well, I'm saying, you know, wh you know why should... You, you, comedy is something we, we want to enjoy, want to be entertained, and all of a sudden you're saying, you know, you should care about this as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, comedy has a time or place, of course, and so at these charity events, you know, I wouldn't say that we turn on a dime, but there is, you know, I'm trying to have fun as I'm selling items, I'm trying to engage people, um, I'm just trying to keep the room energized. I'm also, at the same time, trying to keep people passionate about the cause, passionate about that particular item that I'm selling. And, and then knowing when to, you know, leave the comedy aside and move into, you know, a paddle raise, a fund a need. How do you identify well, that delicate moment? You know, I think it just has to do with my presence on stage. It has to do with how I'm carrying myself. It has to do with my tone. And, and I, you know, I'm not really sure how it is that you, I, I mean, I think that you and I could be joking and then, and then you could move into telling me something serious and we would stop and, and have that know. serious moment, right. you know? Okay. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but people, e even if you're raising money to end breast cancer or some, you know, something very serious, people still want to have a good time at that event. I mean, you know that you're going to have those serious moments when you talk about why we're here. And you know that we're going to have speakers who tell really painful stories and remind us of the importance of supporting that great organization. And then in those moments, we'll, we'll get people enthused about the, the great work ahead and we'll get them raising their, their bid cards. But I feel like I'm able to connect with those people because they were joking with me and having a great time earlier. I mean, my whole, my whole modus operandi is that I want people to feel not like I'm some separate entity on stage, but that I'm the host of this great party, as if I was at your house and you invited me over and we're having this great time and we're all laughing together. And so when it's now time for you to stop and be serious and tell me something, I'm really hanging on your every word because we're friends. I'm totally hanging on every word right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hanging on your words. All right, too. excellent. <laughs> Kids, Casper, baby pants. Those must that must be the hardest audience ever to, it, to try to get kids motivated. But kids to, are great. They're so innocent and they they just want to have fun. They love the music. They love the simplicity. I mean, we really work to keep the music very simple and very fun. Chris Ballou is Casper, baby pants. I mean, it is his brainchild and genius. And um, 
So what do you it, do when you're it's out there? Only, on... It's only hard if they want us to play longer than 45 minutes and then their <laughs> attention spans are <laughs> they're on to other things. Uh, it's, it's hard two times, actually. It's hard if, if, if we're playing longer than 45 minutes or it's hard if we're playing at like a water park or a, <laughs> or a place where there's a bouncy totally house. Totally distracted, right? <laughs> yeah, the, if there's a bouncy house, then we've lost them. So what's your role then during a performance? My role is percussion player, and so I shakers, washboards, I've, I'm standing up, but I also have a hi-hat and a bass drum that I'm playing with my feet as I'm doing all these other things. Um, that's my role. And then there's a, another guy who's also a theater sports improv guy like myself, uh, whose name is Ron Hippie, and he's playing the keyboards. And so Ron and I, both being improv guys, we're running around, we're having a good time. We're both standing up, whereas Casper himself is sitting down. And Are you so, dressed like this normally? Do you have this? No, we on? wear, we all have these matching yellow shirts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's, it's it's slightly different. So how does it feel when you're doing that kind of performance ver versus what you're doing for a client or for at an auction? I mean, that to me is just it is really it is pure joy and pure fun because I mean, kids are an incredible audience. They're having fun with us. They're singing along. They're dancing. They're just so happy. And I truly love the music. I got involved because I heard the music. Uh, I was producing a show for Seattle Channel and. And we were interviewing Chris about his new President's album, and he played Casper Baby Pants for me. And I said, I would love to let, let, let me just come to a show and play some percussion with you, you know, and you'll have a little two man band. And so I love the music. And so for me, it's just, it's, it's the joy of being a musician. And, and it's, it's like being uh, on the theater sports comedy improv stage. We get paid a little amount of money, but it's really more just for the, the joy of the art. So I mean, you're and involved. the collaboration, you know, with other great artists. So you're involved in creating all this content, whether it, uh, you know, videos or advertisements or for Casper baby pants. We seem, as parents, and you're a parent as well, we've got all these screens now, right? And yeah. our kids have access to all these screens. Uh, how do you handle it? How do you sort of put your family on a diet so this stuff is taken in in, in balance? Well, I mean. We talk a lot about that. I mean, for one, we've kind of followed the, the guidelines as I understand them, and we, ha you know, we just are careful not to expose our kid to, to any screen, really, before she was two. I now have a two-and-a-half-year-old, and so we've kind of slowly piecemealed little amounts of, of TV and entertainment. For us, it's, it's been a lot more about music and a lot more about... Um, so music is safe compared to, say, stuff on the screen, then, you think, as, as an entertainer and as a parent? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think so. We listen to a lot of classical music, a lot of jazz around our house, a lot of Casper Baby Pants, of course. I mean, she loves Casper Baby Pants and identifies it by name. And yes, I mean, I make a point of having music playing or of turning the music off and us creating music together. We'll pull out a ukulele and she'll pull out some hand percussion instruments. Um, but it's not just about their access to the screen. I think as a parent, it's also about my, like, how much t am, am I with my phone if I'm around my kids. I mean, I try to turn off my phone if I'm going to really be focused with my kids. On Sundays, I've been trying this experiment of completely turning so off. So a Sabbath, a digital the, Sabbath. The digital Sabbath, yeah. Completely turning off the, the internet, the, the phone, the everything, so that I can really be focused on being with my family. And so we, you know, we, we definitely, I mean, there are times when my wife is home alone and she's putting down the six-month-old, and, and so the Two and a half year old watches 15 minutes of Play With Me Sesame or some Sesame Street program or something like that. But we, I, I think, you know, I think it's not hiding it from her, but just teaching her moderation and, and demonstrating for her moderation. So, briefly then, enthrall, engage. Is there a difference for you or is it the same thing? Um, I think I enthrall by engaging, I guess, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think that there are different ways to have fun. You know, you can have fun because you're just passively watching a piece of art. You can have fun because you're getting, uh, you know, some sort of adrenaline rush. You're getting, and I, to me, what I try to do is look at, can I combine more than one of those in whatever experience it is that I'm creating? You know, so that it's not just a passive experience, but it's not just like a zip line adrenaline rush, but it's some sort of combination of the two. That's a great place to leave things. So you've heard from Fred Northrup Jr. at the peak of entertainment and Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson at the peak of community. When we return, we'll bridge these peaks together. We'll discuss what the Pacific Northwest has to teach the rest of the world.
Welcome back. I'm with entertainer Fred Northup Jr. and pediatrician blogger Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson. Well, we're talking about technology, we're talking about blogging, we're talking about kids and comedy. How do we handle being present with our kids when we are surrounded by these screens and, and we're being distracted all the time? Or can you even be present if you've got a screen? Well, that's what we were talking about in the break. You know, we were saying um, you can only do one thing at a time, right? There's great data that says that. You know, we pride ourselves on being multitaskers, but we were discussing about how you don't really have great memory of moments when you're trying to do three things at once. But, you know, I was, I was saying I took a break. So last August, I didn't blog. I didn't tweet. I didn't go on Facebook. I had to respond to emails um, to keep things going. But beside email, I did hardly anything on my smartphone. And... That's part of what we do to understand how to, to find balance, right? I think extremes are really helpful. So, you know, the last two years have been this absolute fire hydrant of social media for me to understand how I can use it in work, but also I do it, I mean, I text to my nanny, I text to my husband, I, I'm on Facebook learning about my friends, right? So I've been embedded in it in all different ways, but that time away also really defines where's the true meaning and where's the gift of this technology, and where is looking at the sky and listening to what's happening around useful as well. But how do we convey this to parents? Because it almost feels like a, a, a global addiction. Well, it, I think they are addicted. We know that. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, there's been some great writing recently about being surgically connected to your phone. We are addicted to them. It can be difficult for me on a typical day not to check my phone, to say, I'm going to take a break. I don't, I don't use my phone in the car. So I've been really good about trying to put my phone in my purse in the back seat. So that's been one kind of jailing myself away from it. <laughs> jailing yourself really? Like that. stealing myself <laughs> to say, like, if my, if my purse is in the back and I hear the ding, ding, right, for the text, I can't deal with it. It's a really sa it's a safety measure for me. But then, you know, the idea of like, sometimes I literally think like, okay, I'm not going to check my phone from the parking lot to clinic. I I'm not going to do that. And I have to do that for myself. And then sometimes I'll look up and there's a bird flying, right? And it's like, ha oh, it's this, it's reinvesting. Because it's not, I think the addiction isn't just as it relates to your family, but it's no. also, you know, as it relates to your ability to even conduct work during mm -hmm. the day. And my employee, Mikal and I have been having a conversation about Listen, we need to start just agreeing that from, you know, we'll check email from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then from 10 a.m. until 2 o'clock, we're shutting our phones mm -hmm. off. We're shutting our email off so that we can actually be present with each other and engage and work on these creative projects that we're working on. Because, you know, when you've got phones ringing and email going off, you feel as though you're multitasking. But as you said, the, the data suggests that we are not great multitaskers. And you really can only be doing one thing at a time. And if you want to do it well, you have to be present with that task. Absolutely. Well, and I think we have to value space and time for reflection. Yes. I mean, particularly in, as a writer now and trying trying to think of, not, not trying to think of, I think I, I blog all day long. Everywhere I go, every picture I see, every child I witness, every study that I read, everything I think about is like, how am I going to do that so that it's entertaining and interesting? Or what did that make me feel? And why did my stomach drop right there? And what was the story in that, right? So I think and think and think. I'm constantly working. But it, we really need time for genuine reflection as parents, as human beings, not, not just because um, we need to be present with our children on the floor with blocks, but ultimately as human beings who are evolving, right? I mean, there is something about age and wisdom, and it is time and reflection that gets us there. You know, what I know now as a pediatrician for, versus what I knew six years ago right when I started, it's not that I'm that much smarter. It's that I've had both experience and time for reflection, and, and all of that coming together to hopefully be wiser when I give advice. Speaking of entertaining and interesting, Fred, uh, Wendy Sue wrote this recently in her blog. Life is short and very weird. Make sure the weird part is true. Take risks when you can. Worry less and work hard to make sure that happens. Figure out a way to trust the world, even online. How would you respond to that when you look at the kind of work that you do and the way you live your life? Uh, well, you know, the, the taking risks when you can stuff uh, certainly resonates with me. And I try to do that both in my own work and take comedic risks, but I also try to just encourage it just with my kids and the type of play that we're doing and so I mean I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Where would that sentiment come from? That came from the movie Beginners which was I you know I don't tend to watch a lot of movies I mean people often ask me like how do you get so much done and I I say I don't watch a lot of TV I mean because if I did I'd love to watch TV but I'd run out of all these hours in the day and I uh, my battery ran out on a flight to South by Southwest and I pulled up my iPad and I watched Beginners and it's an incredible movie about healing and life and doctoring and trust and self-awareness. But, you know, I think um, there, you know, people who are weird, people who are willing to take great risks and act goofy and be crazy and allow themselves some space and time to explore, 
really get it all, right? It's, it's, they, they can reach up high where it's really light and, and the pressure isn't as high, and they can dig in really deep in the dirt. And I think um, sometimes, you know, when I watch the experience of parenthood in clinic, or I feel the experience of parenthood in my own life, it is this, we are, we are, we are, we are so over flooded with information. There's such an abundance of content coming at us all the time that we're, we're trying to perfect our lives. And ultimately, the perfection of our lives is disengaging and trusting our instincts. Hmm. And it's, 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 we, we gotta let, we gotta let go. You know, last year I bought a pink wig and I was saying, <laughs> I did. And I was saying to my friends, like, I'm, a, I, I like, I should just go out. I'm gonna wear this pink wig. And everyone's like, that's just crazy. And I was like, why is that that crazy? Like, <laughs> I just wanna wear a pink wig and go out and about. And I wore it on Halloween, but like, I am going downtown to eat dinner some night and I will be wearing that pink wig. And my husband will play. I'm like, he, that'll be fun. Like, who cares? Like, who cares? Yeah. And I, th right? and I, I mean, being an improviser, I play a lot of improv games with my two and a half year old and it is so much fun. I mean, we will just sit, just the two of us looking at each other and I'll make up a word. I'll say, Vlada de boo boo. And she will take it in and look at it and then she'll make up a word and say, and make up a brand new, flaka de ka ka. And she'll say that back to me and we'll just, you know, and I'll enjoy her word and we'll just go back and forth doing that. Or I'll, I'll tell a story. I'll say, once upon a time there was a, she'll say, a dog. And I'll say, that dog wanted something more than anything in the world. He wanted, she'll say, to eat oranges. And I was like, yeah, but there was this orange tree and guarding it was a, and we'll just create stories together and be silly and, and just really engaged and present. Where, where'd that come from for me? Because your dad is a minister, I understand. Mad Libs, that's Mad Libs, man. <laughs> Mad Libs. I'm totally ripping yeah. off Mad Libs. Mad, yeah, <laughs> well it's, it's, an, it's I mean, it, firstly my parents are both artistic and outgoing people. My father is an Episcopal minister, um, yes, but he also, you know, sings in this big barbershop group and, and plays guitar and is kind of a great, uh, you know, storyteller like Garrison Keillor or something. And my mom uh, is a singer and also plays guitar and piano as well. And they're, they're, they're both a riot. And so, I mean, it, it certainly comes from them. But, but you know, improv is absolutely about being 100% present. It's about listening and it's about taking what you hear and, and really absorbing it and then giving a gift back to the person by, by hearing what, you, what they say and then saying, yes, I hear what you say and I'm gonna add to that with this. And so you absolutely could never do improv with a cell phone in your hand at the same time. <laughs> and that's your great revelation for your blog post was because you were stuck on a plane where you couldn't communicate to the, your usual people. Yeah, that's right. No, that was a, a flight where I had said I'd hit a new low where I scheduled a meeting mid-flight and I did a G-chat meeting online. And oh. I was like, this is not good. Like, when you're <laughs> scheduling the time in the air, and then my battery ran out, it was just, Delicious. I mean, air, the air used to be a protected place, but now we've right. got Wi-Fi on board too. And so they're talking about there's... actually revisiting devices on planes right. as well, which is kind of scary. I mean, I, I really believe we we will regress. There will be a backlash to the way that we live now, in the sense that your grocery store attendant is on a device, and the person stocking's on a device, and we're on a device. We we will we will come back. I mean, you know, one of my favorite blog posts I ever wrote was um, a new rule: be without a ceiling. If every single day you had a time, it's not about reaching for the stars, it's about going outside. Just going outside. You know, there's some um, beautiful writing about nature deficit disorder in children. The idea that, you know, children are really different and their health is suffering because they're not outside and they're not invested in the world around them. And for all sort for all sorts of reasons and health conditions. And I think I think we will step back. I think we're addicted, we are allured, and the competition of a real person and a device is gonna be really difficult. People, and people are engineering these devices to be magical. And, and what we will realize is that stepping into the world where there's dirt and grass and sky with real people is just extraordinary. Is there any way you, through your work, Fred, what you just heard there, in terms of inspiring kids to get out there, to connect, to get into nature, whether it's through your videos or through your music, that that could actually be something that happens? It's interesting, because so much of the, the entertainment that I do is inside, although I you know, have a great love for the outdoors. So that's, a, that's a, something for me to think about as, we, as I leave here. Um, I'm indoors a lot too. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always say, you know, I think my tag on Google Plus is like always trying to get outside. I'm always trying to, I'm not outside very much, but I'm always trying to get there. And I think that's just a part of our reality. And I, I think a lot of us are searching for that. You know, when I write about cell phone use in kids, and then I write about cell phone use in parents, everybody is thinking about that. And we're all struggling and chewing on it. Well, and in terms of swinging the pendulum, I mean, I, my hope is that the kids who are being raised with this technology, and I see it even in my daughter, that they're not they're not impressed with it. It's just 
part of their norm. Whereas for me, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just I I got the new iPod, and so I'm just I'm uh, you know I want to try it out. Whereas if you grow up with it, it's not not a big deal. Yeah. And so I mean, there are local organizations, you know, whether it's Bike Works, you know, who are helping kids get bicycles so they can go outside, and Coyote Creek, where they're learning real hands-on skills and doing photography and paint and improv and just uh, you know making paper mache things and you know. I, I love those organizations where it's it's not digital. It's just getting your hands on something and actually doing you know getting a sense of accomplishment and pride from something that you where you're actually creating it. So tons of auctions, charitable events in this area, great health institutions, and obviously somebody who's leading the way in terms of a new way of thinking, communicating about health. Is there something that works really well in our region when it comes to philanthropy and health generally? If you think about the Pacific Northwest, is there something special about the way we look at caring and we look at these particular elements? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that many places to contrast it with. I mean, I, I've lived all over the country, but I, um, you know, I think there, you know, I'm a Minnesotan. That's where I grew up. And one of the reasons I've landed here so squarely and so happily is that people are nice to each other here. Pe people are really willing to take time um, to understand their community and to think about the environment in, in a profoundly different way than most of the U.S. You know, where I went to medical school in Philadelphia, we, we couldn't even recycle. And I got out here and we were composting. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like, whoa, like this is a whole new world. So, I mean, I think health and wellness and environmental issues, all, all of these do go together. I mean, we have incredible corporations here. We have the Gates Foundation. I mean, we have incredible world-leading, beating people who are drawn to this region because of the beauty of this land and then because of the niceness of the people. I mean, I, I think that's I think that's what health and philanthropy are all about. I mean, it isn't how much money it is, right? It's it's that people are invested in giving something. And people, I mean, you really see that. I mean, that is the joy of being an auctioneer in the charity world mm -hmm. in Seattle is week after week after week, I'm getting to watch people be incredibly generous and support these organizations that they're so passionate about. And it's especially, you know, auctions tend to have what they call a fund to need, a paddle raise, where I'm no longer selling a trip to Cabo or you're not gonna get this car, but what you are gonna do is raise your paddle and donate money to a cause that you're passionate about. You're going to go home feeling like you've, you know, really made a difference in the lives of somebody. And and people are so generous week after week after week. It's really it's a it is a beautiful thing to be a part of. Is it something specific? Why is it why is this happening here? What's going on here? I mean, even you, Wendy C, wrote that I landed in Seattle where the air smells different and you felt at home here. What's mm -hmm. What's, what's going on here that doesn't seem to be replicated elsewhere in the country? I mean, you are right when you talk about the corporations. That I mean, yeah. you know, we are, we are leaders. I mean, you have companies, you know, first you have Microsoft who, I mean, I think it's like $15,000 per employee that they will match dollar for dollar when you donate to charity. And then the Gates Foundation says, okay, we'll see that and we're going to do it three to one. So if you give $10,000 to your favorite organization, they're going to get $40,000 because we're going to match them yeah. three to one. And I mean, that is really raising the bar and being... A, uh, you know, an example to the to, to push people because we can all do a little more and give a little more, and you know, Seattle just has great leadership in that space. Yeah. I mean, that's how community exists, right? We we learn with this is just exactly the model of parenting, right? Is when we're talking about our cell phones, so much of what we're doing is modeling. That's how children right. learn. I mean, they start imitating at nine months of age sounds, right? They wave and they point and they do all these things right in the very beginning. And echolalia of just you even playing that game of improv really came from the very beginning of learning how to respond and create the same sound that somebody else did. So we're so fortunate to live in a place where where the where people are working towards improving. I mean, we like when you look at the health system here, we're a world leader in health as well. So. I, I think these corporations do lead the way and provide a community that has exceptional standards for things. They want really good coffee, and they, they would really love the <laughs> sky to be blue, right? Yeah. I mean, we have really <laughs> high hopes for things. Um, but and we I, support I, I, our libraries. We support our yeah. parks. I mean, we, we, we and really... we're working at supporting our schools. We will get there. We will get there, yeah. So, you know... And you've, you've spoken about scaling back what you do, but you're becoming bigger and bigger. And, you know, for both of you, you could actually strike it really big where you go international. Can you still justify staying here, or will the big lights, big city, sort of bright lights, big city, draw you to a New York or a London or an LA? Or are you saying, no, I'm making my stand, I'm staying here? I mean, you obviously, when, you know, I don't want to speak for you, I can only speak for me. My, I mean, I, I love Seattle. I'm, I plan on staying in Seattle. My parents in law are here, and, and, you know, having them close to us, and they're very involved with our kids as well. And so, you know, Seattle, I, I, I 
my video production world with Southdown Creative, we sh shoot in New York and LA a fair amount, and I love going there and visiting there and then coming back home to Seattle. So I, I plan on being here. It's got, uh, you know, great art, great culture, and but still feels like a small, like a small enough town. Is there a specific sense of humor to Seattle or the Pacific Northwest that doesn't really translate anywhere else? I haven't found that. I mean, you know, we, um, no, I mean, and, and humor is obviously subjective. I mean, I, I think about even when, when Seinfeld was the number one show on TV, it Very was getting, New York. it was getting, but, and it was getting like a 30 share, which in TV means that of all the TVs on, only a third of them were watching Seinfeld, and it was the most popular show on TV. So, you know, the, I'm going to connect with some people more than I connect with others, but I just, I think you have to be who you are. I mean, whether you're Seinfeld or Carlin or whoever, you tour around, you do the same act in, in every city. You just have to be, you have to have your own artistic point of view and come to the stage with that point of view and be true to yourself. You ever thought about incorporating humor in your blog? I don't know. I don't think I'm very funny. <laughs> 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 can can <laughs> you help her? I, no, I mean, I think your, your point, I, I think the one thing I'd also like to say is you don't actually have to leave Seattle to change the world. And you don't have to leave Seattle to interact with the world. That's so that's the true. incredible part of living in the time that we live. So we've yeah. got all this, you know, we have this digital creep and we're all balancing it. And it's, it's a huge challenge for us as we raise our children. I love your point about the fact that it's just, it is so novel to us. And it's just not that novel to my three-year-old. But that I can do anything I want from Seattle, and why wouldn't I? Right? I mean, why would I move to, why would I live in Manhattan? Or why would I live in LA where I have to sit in traffic for 45 minutes when I can live in a community and have a three-minute commute and take the Burke Gilman? I mean, I just, I don't know why we'd ever have to leave. And it's, again, it's moderation. I don't, like, I have an iPad. I don't shield my daughter yeah, from it. I mean, there, we've got a couple of games, and I sit there with her, and we'll, you know, read a, some some book, but it, you know, on on the iPad, and then we'll put it away. It's I, I think it's just about modeling, and it's about teaching moderation, and and getting outside and playing. And the truth is, because she's grown up with the technology, she's it's fun to do that for 15 minutes. But then she's ready to move on, and she would just as much like to build a train set or build something out of blocks, or you know, play in her kitchen or whatever it is. You know. So as two obviously successful parents. What, what are you most I think brilliant yeah. parents. I, mean, I, I, two of the best. I usually talk about all then, my failures. Then you're going to have really quick, quick responses to this question. Then you know what concerns you most about you know raising your kids in in this environment right now. Well, you know, I, this week I'm choosing a kindergarten for my son, and I've spent a lot of time you know driving home at night from work at nine o'clock saying. Gosh, you know, I don't need him to go to MIT. I just want him to know what to do with his hands and to be surrounded by people who love him and to give and have solutions and to solve the problems he wants to solve. And my biggest concern is that this race and the frenetic way that we get information and use information and solve problems and the way that his parents are modeling to try to change the world makes him feel the burden. You know, I think, I think some people are gifted with contentment. And I, I think it's an, a, a huge challenge to not just have your kid be happy, right? This isn't about like not making him brush his teeth so he's happy. It's about learning to brush your teeth, but also really learning to find time and space to create the person that you know he really wants to be. And, and I think this pace freaks me out. Fred? For me, I, I mean, my main focus right now with her is I'm just, to a certain extent, I do want to I mean, I do shield her from the, the world to a certain extent, I guess. Is, you know, I want her to be able to be a kid as long as she can. And so my fear is just there's just so much kind of, whether it's the violence on TV or whatever it is. I mean, entertainment that I certainly consume as an adult, it's, it's, it feels like with the Internet and with these devices, it's harder and harder. You know, kids are just exposed to more and more adult entertainment at a younger and younger age. And so my, that's, that's really what I'm trying to focus on is, you know, how can I, you know, how can I minimize that as long as I can so that she can stay this... Be a kid. Be a kid, yeah. To so be a I'll kid. shut this device down right yeah. now, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Wendy C. Swanson, Fred Northrup, Jr., thank you for helping us figure out how to care, curate, and connect when it comes to our families. When we return, media space, disrupting higher education, why everything we thought we knew about college is about to change. And now, let's switch into the media space. The knives are out for higher education. We're starting to question its value. With globalization, technology, and a trillion dollars in student debt, academia seems as threatened as mass media or factory jobs. Could many universities follow Borders Bookstores into oblivion? The Chronicle of Higher Education recently asked. 
At South by Southwest EDU in Austin this March, panelists spoke of massive open online courses. That's where tens of thousands of people take classes such as artificial intelligence or robotics for free. The University of Houston already offers a master's degree in math for free and all online. You may ask, how could that replace the traditional classroom experience with its expert teachers and face-to-face -face interaction? Well, it's already happening as we realize that education is no longer a factory pumping out students as the final product. Learners can now choose how they want to connect to useful content and whether they'll even pay for it. It's exactly the same destructive value proposition journalism and entertainment faced a few years back. Even today, they're still figuring out how to win back the revenue growth they lost to the web. Academia still matters. The labor market still recognizes a college degree as a premium metric of competence for a job applicant, for now. More importantly, universities remain this country's primary source of original research that leads to true innovation. And it's that innovation that is the single most crucial factor in driving a competitive economy. So that's why we've decided to hack EDU this spring. Four Peaks is putting on a series of events to boldly reimagine higher education. We will extend our reach to map a community source response to this issue of deep concern. I invite you to extend your reach by attending these events in person or online. Go to fourpeaks.org for details or follow me on Twitter at HRH Media. I'm Hanson Hossein.